Chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you know exactly how powerful a podcast can be, whether it's for entertainment, personal growth, commute time, or your daily, uh, maybe weekly workout in the gym. Podcasts are the medium that millions of people use to get the content that they're looking for. And the question I get most often is, how do you create your podcast? If you haven't heard about Anchor, I'll tell you because a good friend told me. First of all, it's free. We always like to lead with the good stuff. The platform has all the tools you need to record and edit your podcast all from your phone, tablet, or laptop. Anchor then goes to work for you by distributing your podcast episodes for you so it's able to be heard on all the top platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. Best of all, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's a one-stop shop to create your podcast and get your voice heard and your story told. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Representing East Oakland, man. Welcome, welcome back again. Another episode of the Hawk Vision Podcast. Guys, I got a treat for you. I know I always say I'm excited about my guests, but this one, this one is family. This one is one of those ones where uh, we were actually just talking about it, where you look at the calendar and you're like, oh, today's the day. I'm so excited. The person that I have on for you right now is one of the most influential matchmakers and one of the most accomplished businessmen that I know. I can say all of that because we're not just talking about the United States. He's got a verified, he's got verified results in multiple countries. You've seen him on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Good morning, America. USA Today, Sunday brunch for my UK listeners. I got 4%. Um, <laughs> he's listed as one of the top voices on LinkedIn. He's hosted TV shows, Celebs Go Dating, Love Town USA, and now Married at First Sight in the UK. He's one of the hosts of the he's the host of the fastest growing podcast communities in the world. Uh, Better with Paul, author, speaker, big brother, Mr. Paul Bronson. Welcome to the show, sir. Oh, man. Can I say this? All I have to say is this. One of my fondest memories of the world, in the world, should I say, is at the airport, I get picked up. You know where this is going. <laughs> oh, man. I Man, Jeezy playing, favorite song ever. Um, Go crazy. You know, um, man, what was it? Was it Bunt Cakes? Was it Bunt Cakes? Nothing Bunt Cakes, yes. Nothing bunt cakes. And the Palm oh, Juice. Man, that's... <laughs> That's that was uh, that was my introduction to to Oakland. Right yes, there. absolutely. Uh, man, great, great memories. Great memories. Um, you know, what's funny is I don't know if you've forgotten or, or you know, because you'd be all over the place doing doing big things. But the very first podcast, I, very, very first podcast I ever did was with you. You did my inaugural episode of the Hustle Harder podcast. Really? Yes. Oh, my God. W- when was that? roughly nine plus years ago get out yeah you get were out. you were the very first guest i ever had we connected on twitter and it, it you've been big brother ever since wow wow well i'd say we're overdue then absolutely overdue. so All let's right. let's jump right in um okay. when married at first sight first launched um in the united states we had a conversation around playing with the perception of marriage um, and, and what that was doing to the dating culture and, you know, in terms of making it look easy. And I know you've done your due diligence, but what got you on board to do married at first sight in the UK? All right. So I, all right. Can, can I give full context on this? Absolutely. Full all right. So I have had a love hate relationship with dating and relationship themed television. Yes. And, and it's because I've been a part in relationship theme TV in different markets for the last decade. And one thing I could tell you is that the three hottest genres of content on television, politics, sports, and dating relationship themes. Yes. Right. So these are always going to be on TV. Now, if you look over the last decade, what's happened is each one of those just becomes more extreme, right? Politics, more extreme sports, you know, more extreme dating relationship, more extreme, 
right? It all goes off of, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, yes. right? So yeah. the more, the crazier it is, the, the, you know, the, 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 the higher the ratings. Right. And, and my opinion on it is that it's been a very destructive medium and it continues to be, you know, it continues to be in, in, uh, destructive, even more so, yeah. right? And so part of me was saying, all right, look, for some reason, these shows keep <laughs> reaching out to me to do this stuff. It's like, you know, <laughs> how is it that, you know, I kind of got the luck of the draw because there's so many incredible people out here. Yes. And so that I thought, okay, I could either just pass over the platform, which I have. I've passed on a lot of different shows. And when the shows were passed on, I didn't necessarily, I thought that like the whole franchise continued to be dis- uh, destructive. And I'm, I'm not saying that I could have been a saving grace. I'm just saying that I know that there's a lot of pressure when you are either new to TV or you get a television role where you really want to appease the producers, etc. cetera. Right. right. Now I'm at the point, but I think because I've been in the industry for so long that when I'm picked up on a project I I sometimes get picked up and I'm able to negotiate a role as a producer or an executive producer or to work in casting or to work in story or to work in hiring talent on the show, et cetera. Okay. And, And so when Married at First Sight approached me maybe about a year and a half to two years ago, uh, this is in the UK and it's one company that owns this franchise in I think 29 different countries. Wow. Um, when they approached me, they, you know, they gave me the outline and they basically said, you know, this franchise is, is a, like a losing franchise. We've been on for five years. Uh, we haven't had a successful match. You know, here are the issues. We want you to come on, not just as talent, but we want you to come on. We want you to like revamp this whole thing. Okay. And so it was an opportunity for me to come in and literally revamp the system. I was able to come in and say, let's make this reflective of modern Britain. Like mm. let's, let's, we, we, speci- we went hard after um, actually after black singles. Okay. And that in itself was a story. I was about but to say that's, had, that's rare in itself. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we had a, we not only when I say we went after, we had an entirely separate casting campaign to go after uh, you know, black people in the UK. Okay. We went after quote unquote older people in the UK, which now I, I hear older people is over 40. So. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> we got our own demo now, right? <laughs> oh, man, it's crazy. And they were like, yeah, let's go over older. I said, what's older? They said 40. I said, oh, Lord. <laughs> so, you know, it's, we went after, but we went after people who, you know, it was just, it was just a myriad of people. We actually, uh, went after uh, gay couples, you know, for the first time. Yeah. It was one of those where they really let us revamp it. And so that's the that's the reason why. I mean, I was able to to, to come in and really put my stamp on it. So you, you've traveled all over the world and been in the business and relationship space. And we're going to jump into business soon, but I want to stay here with relationships just a little bit. What do you think are the key differences and similarities in relationships in regards to women of power, women that have accomplished their own business, women that have, you know, purchased their own home, several of them, so to speak, and, and, and the issues they deal with when it comes to dating. All right. So this is where a lot of people are going to say, um, Paul, you're crazy. Um, I honestly don't think there's that, that, that the major distinction is between, um, power or um money or um you know or or anything along those lines okay i I truly think that the division is between people who are healthy mentally Mm. and those who are not right so so for example i'll just give a quick example is you think about narcissism yes i think a lot of people who think about super powerful, ultra type A, you know, super, you know, get everything done. They think, okay, they're probably narcissists. And quite (laughs) honestly, if you look at the narcissism scale, which is kind of like from zero to 40, the people who are, so I've, I've actually just did my narcissism test Uh and I'm a 20, 
two. Borderline. Which, yeah, which puts me borderline, <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm borderline narcissist, right? I love it. You know? Now, the the some of the most successful people in the world are full blown. You know, they rate thirty five. You know, thirty six, mm. forty, etc. Now, those are folks who never ever in their life will be able to maintain a healthy relationship. They use people like a cup of coffee. Yes. Right? When you're hot and I need a hit of caffeine, they'll consume you. They'll be all over you. But the moment that the caffeine high is gone or the coffee is cold, they throw you out. Right? Wow. That, 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 now that is an example of the difference, you know, someone who say narcissistic or not, right? Right. Mentally healthy and not, right? But when it comes to someone who just has power, you could have extraordinary power, but yet not be a narcissist, be incredibly humble, you know, like bunt cakes, listen to Jeezy, you know what I mean? (laughs) I love it, I love it. Yeah, you could have all those things and you're not going to have the same issue. So I I think the real distinction is, is around mental health, self-esteem, self-love. So I think all of all of Atlanta the is is going to argue and and maybe some of California too. I'm, I'm thinking of the places Pennsylvania where a lot of my listeners are. They're going to say the women there um that listen to the show are are going to say I, maybe it's around expectations, right? Because they say that they intimidate men because they're so accomplished. And so it becomes this um, I met a man who isn't ready yet for me, for a woman like me. I'm strong. I have this going. I've accomplished X, Y, Z. I don't necessarily need. However, I am looking for and they come across this perception of men are intimidated by them. And and what do you say to that in terms of uh, mentally healthy, mentally prepared? Not saying the women are crazy, ladies, for the, you or the listening, um, but in general, in regards to managing the expectations around a relationship, what would you say to that? I, I really, you know, it's interesting. This conversation around intimidation has not changed in years. In me being in this space for over a decade. Yeah. Like, I, I literally remember, man, is, um, um, and this is, this is only because, uh, you know, I'm not in the U.S. much anymore. Is sure. uh, Tom Joyner still on air or no? Yeah, 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 yeah. He has his own, like, little thing now, but, yeah, still on. Okay, so so ten years ago, I was talking to Tom Joyner about the same thing, man. The same thing, right? A matter of fact, I think he even used Atlanta as the example. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's crazy. The, 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 the first thing I'm going to say about this is I truly believe that our perception, in particular, I think as black people, right? Because I'm gonna assume that we're talking to a lot of our folk on this. Absolutely. Is that, our, I, I truly believe our perception is off. And what I mean by our, our perception is off is that we're fed this pseudo reality that women, if you are, um, you know, smart slash educated slash a little bit of money, that a you're going to, that a there's no man out there for you basically, right? Right, and that the men are inferior right so we're also fed this whole myth that men black men in particular are only they're super promiscuous uh we are um you know uh you know we're you know we're just inferior in every way yeah now i don't want to get into you know uh d- people who may think about conspiracy theories or etc <laughs> agendas and that kind of thing sure but i but i think that you can't have that conversation and not bring to light the fact that we are literally being programmed to do this Yeah. to the point where, you know, and, and I'm not trying to get off track, but I think sure. this is really important is that, okay, we take most of our cues, unfortunately, from television, from music, uh, from, um, you know, from social, but for the most part, it's driven by television, music and big screen. Correct. Now, because I've, I've literally been in TV for 10 years mm-hmm. on all sides, production, etc., I'm going to tell you that TV 
is strictly put in place, not put in place to educate you. Even the shows that you think are there to educate you, it, it is there to entertain you. Right. And it's not only there to entertain you there, it's there to keep your eyes glued longer than you are glued to something else. Mm. And the moment that us as big, bad TV people realize that, oh, if we just play into that narrative that the women are, you know, are, are intimidating all men. If we if we if we set those s- s- uh, scenarios up, you're going to tune in longer. Yeah. If we set up scenarios where men look like complete asses. Right. Then you're going to tune in longer. If we, Oh, if we set up the scenarios where the man we know he's a cheater and we bring him on. Oh, yeah. You're going to tune in longer. So my point is that we're taking cues from people who are literally telling us, like, feeding us fiction. Wow. And and I think that we have to really keep that in mind because I have a lot of great friends in Atlanta who have, I mean, man, um, Dr. Tart, Alduan Tart. Yeah. Right? Is That's my man. He's in Atlanta. The stand up dude. Yeah. Right? Stand up dude. Like, Chris, like all the people I know, I was going to say Chris Cooper, all these people I know, man, these are stand up dudes. These, these, And so I guess my point is that I truly think that we're being fed this. And what we really need to do, specifically as black people, specifically as people who, if you want, if you truly desire to be in a healthy relationship, you have to do everything humanly possible to get around healthy relationships wow. right you yes. gotta get around people like my man chuck like you gotta be, get around you <laughs> yes, i'm sir. serious yes sir i'm serious you you, you and, and you have to be able to delineate um you know what is fiction from 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 fact and i'm telling you what you see on tv is all fiction what you're hearing in music is mostly all fiction so just to drive that that home is that um, you know, and I'll, I guess I'll sum it up by saying this is that I would say 99% of men who truly want to be in a committed relationship, mm. who are emotionally healthy, will not be intimidated by the fact that you have made a certain amount of money, right. but because of the fact that you have a certain level of status, because of the fact that you are incredibly attractive, like those are all the things that are going to make the health, the emotionally healthy, stable man love you. Yes. However, the crazy man, the <laughs> narcissistic man who wants to play on your emotion. Yeah. That's going to be the guy who says, no, nah, I'm intimidated. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And, I couldn't so, agree more. So, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I this is this, that one, man. I'm sorry. What did we talk about, right? So we said <laughs> we said we got me and you could go off on like 50 million tangents because it's <laughs> literally, you know, big brother, little brother talking. And, and one of the reasons why I'm so glad you're on is because we can pivot and have all of these conversations. And so the, the last thing I want to do on, on relationships is, um, yes, it's part perception, but there is a bit of truth to this one. Um Women saying that they got the man ready for the next girlfriend or the next person that's going to be the wife. They did all the hard work and now they got that man ready for the next person. What are your thoughts on that one? He just wasn't the right one for you. I mean, it's, you know, here's one thing, too, that I'll say about relationships is that it's not complicated. Right. I, I think we have to, you know. I know it's now, depending on who you ask, a $29 billion industry in the U.S., love, dating, et cetera, books, and people make, you know, TV shows. And, you know, like, I get all of that. But the reason why it's so, when you see big industries like that, it's because, it's typically because of something that is basic and simple, and the big industry just wants to overcomplicate it so that you'll keep buying the books, reading the, 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 you know, watching the shows, etc. Yeah. So here's the point. If you're with someone and that person doesn't commit to you, doesn't want to be with you, whether that's a man or a woman, right? Yeah. Whether that's a homosexual relationship, right? Heterosexual relationship, whatever. If, the, if they're just not into you, then they're just not into you. Right. And there's nothing 
There's no amount of you preparing them or you getting them ready or you, you know, great sex, great whatever. There's no amount of any of that yeah. that's going to keep them. So the problem, and this is where a lot of ladies I know right now are going to want to reach out this mic or the, the headset <laughs> and smack me. But I'm going to tell you what the problem is. The problem isn't that you got him ready. The problem is that you didn't recognize early enough that he wasn't the right one for you. Let's go. Let's this is go. Where we need, this is where we need to focus. And I'm, and I'm not just pointing this, the finger at, at, at women on this. I'm talking about men who are in relationships with ladies and the ladies leave them. Is that, the, the, you know, there's some key areas that we really need to focus on. A lot of people are focused on like, you know, in the dating because, uh, because you know, Chuck, uh, Jill and I, we had a matchmaking agency for ten years. Yes. And the number one question that we would get when people would come into the agency is, "All right, what do I need to wear?" Oh my to, god! You know, to to to, be, to you know to to look sexy. What do I need to say <laughs> on the first date to get to the second date? What should I not say on the first date? Right. These are the top questions people are asking oh my god these are the skills yeah th these are the skills you're trying to trying to develop but let me tell you the more important skills the more important skills are things like how do you determine if someone is a good or a bad match for you right mm. that now that's a skill that's a question that you need to ask if you don't know how to do that that's something that you need to work on right how can you increase your self-esteem the higher your self-esteem, because because we we all run around talking about oh yeah yeah you know I'm worth this I'm a I'm a king I'm a queen yeah right. yeah we talk about that but then we let peasants run over us. Woo. You're you're no king, you're no queen if you let a peasant run over you because that means you don't know your worth. You can't be a king, you can't be a queen unless you truly know your worth, unless you truly know your value. So that's an area to focus on, your self-esteem, because that's where your value comes in, right? These are the type of areas that we need to be focused on. And when you are a master at those, when you focus on those, and those are all skills you can develop, yes. then you will never go prepare somebody who's not, is not, is not committing to you. You'll yeah. never do that. Yeah, I think it's funny. I tell everybody that asked me um, in, in regards to how I knew that that Tanil was the one. It was it was part it was in part feeling, but two, it was and I, and I think you can relate to this with Jill. It was the fact that everything we did together made me feel like I was adding value to her and she was absolutely adding value to me. And I never had to question that. And so everything else became part of the process of learning how to fine tune adding value. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Helen Fisher, a uh, renowned psychologist mm. uh, and anthropologist, actually, oh, wow. she talks about love as a bid, right? And what you're doing is it's exactly what you just said you did with the Tennille is that, you know, you do something for her. She does something for you. You do something for her, she does something for you. Maybe you do three things for her, she does two things for you, right? It's not that you need to keep track, but the point is is that you're putting in a bid and she puts in a bid. If you, it. now Chuck, tell me this. Man, let's say that you put in 5,000 bids. Yes. And she hasn't even looked at you. Are you going to put in the 5,000 in one bid? No, not... I, not only am I not doing it, I'm probably flipping over a table. So I'm trying to watch my words here. <laughs> but I totally, yeah, no, there's no way I would. And I think people get caught up in doing that, right? They get caught up in this is what I can do. This is what I can look like. This is what I can provide for you. And you pour all in before you get to learning who the person is and and how to communicate your wants and desires and needs and what type of support you can provide. You get we get caught up in what we what we can do. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. And that and then that turns into let me just do, do, do. do. Oh, my God, you're going. And then what, what's the song? You keep on using me until you use me up. So you use me. Exactly. Man, I wish my exactly. falsetto was working right now. I, I, <laughs> I would have busted out on that one. Let's let's shift gears just a little bit. 
<laughs> um, yeah, that's one of the. I gotta have more whiskey to 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 get my falsetto kicked in. It's oh, a, really? You, you, really? You're on whiskey now. That's, that's I your thing. am the past couple of years, man. I see. That's funny. You know me so well. The past couple of years, I I have been heavy on and my favorite brand is actually uncle nearest and i don't know if you're familiar with the story but um long story short they are the uh the family of the slave that taught jack daniels how to make whiskey um, I do know that story. yeah fine yeah. weaver uh and that whole group yeah. they i mean phenomenal and it tastes so good like you even if, we're going to talk about the better with paul but you got to get fine weaver on um She's amazing. I just the story, the way they were able to market it, the awards they're racking up and, and the taste is just it's it's amazing. So that's my little plug. Um, let's jump into you've you've had the better with Paul episode. I mean, the better with Paul podcast. You have had some of the most untouchable, unfindable like super mega stars on and recently the the episode that I just finished listening to you you had an episode where you interviewed Jacob Caesar who's built yes. a massive fortune in Ghana um and you started talking about investing over there and the businesses that um that he was going what was your aha business moment during that conversation where you realized this was going to be different than everything else you've done it, you know it's it's fascinating that you mentioned uh, different because he's become one of my best friends. Wow. Um, yeah. We, a matter of fact, we just filmed a documentary together. We shot uh, a joint podcast together, like a, a podcast series. Uh, I talk to him every, probably every day. Um, so uh, yeah, N- Nana's is, is um, man, he's, he's that dude. He's an incredible guy. You know, I, I think I, I truly believe man. it's kind of like you too, Chuck. It's like, I think just within the first few moments, yeah, you know, you just feel you could just see if you vibe. And by the way, like this connects to romantic relationships, but I, I truly believe that um, you know ultimately we all have a certain level of emotional intelligence. Yes, and emotional intelligence is really a, about us being a, is being aware, right? We're aware of how people are reacting to us or reacting to us to a situation. Okay. And if you can, and by the way, everyone has the ability to increase your emotional emotional awareness, right? Yes. It, which is which is great. Yeah. Now, I think when you have a high level of emotional intelligence, it's not that it's just like a sixth sense. It's just you know, you can tell by the way uh, someone defers to you, by the way that they maybe smile at you, by um, uh, you know the tone in their voice by the pacing by the allowance that they give you in terms of space to just talk it's like it's like you know you know yeah and with nana i knew probably within the first like 60 seconds i was like man th- like this guy like w- we're going to be close friends you know I he's love incredible it. But you you have this so like I always tell I tell my wife all the time like I'm good right I'm really good and I know that part but you have and that's why you're a big brother because I I love to watch people that have achieved the things that I'm shooting for right and that's why you've always been a mentor to me but you have this innate ability to attract billionaires <laughs> and 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 for everything that I um love about you that's the thing that like i just i know it's emotional intelligence i know it's personal growth but i also know that networking and access create additional networking networks and access what was it about his his business practices that that you found to be something you could latch on to like i know he said um you know he's personable he still smiles with people he still like you know treats everybody as if they're equal but when you guys had that conversation was there was there a piece that you were like you know what that's part of my non-negotiables as well yeah yeah i mean i I think you're really astute to to single in on him as a character of study because he not only has been successful in Ghana, but he was also successful in the UK. I mean, one of his claims to fame is by the time he was 18, and keep in mind, he came from an impoverished um, you know, family. Yes. By the time he was 18, he had already banked a million pounds, right? Which is more than a, a dollar, right? A pound yeah, is yeah, more yeah. than a dollar. So 
he, he had already banked that. Like, it's one of those where he's done some really incredible things. You know, for me, the three kind of, if I were to pull three things from him, would be, first is, he is very confident in what he knows. So he's confident in his skills. Okay. Right? And I think that's, confidence is important because people in relationships, they say confidence is sexy. Yeah, it definitely is. But confidence creates confidence, right? So, you know, like Chuck, let me go back to you. Like when you come on to these, to these podcasts, you come on in a confident manner. And then what you do is then you help the guest now not only become comfortable, but they become confident, Yeah. which, and when you're confident, you're willing to take risks and that's very important. Right. Wow. So, so what, what, what Nana does is he, and by the way, uh, for, for some of you, because uh, you heard Chuck say he, fr- Freedom uh, Jacob, he go he has t- two different aliases, which that in itself is a story. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but he goes by Nana Kwame Bediako, but also Freedom Jacob Caesar. And then also on the streets, they call him Cheta, you know, because of all his money. Right. Um, but this guy is highly confident and he creates confidence, right? So that's one thing that he does. The second thing that he does is he knows how to do business with everyone. Mm. He he knows how, like, you know, I remember talking to someone once and they were like, um, you know, um, uh, well, I guess long story short is we were talking about code switching. Yes. And, and, (laughs) and, and, and and what I've learned though, living in London, because there's so many uh, uh, West Africans in particular in London is that, yeah, there's code switching. You can go between, say, your black and white friends. Yes. But then there's a whole multitude of other switching where you go up and down the socioeconomic scale, where you jump into different cultures, where it's then not just simply about you becoming someone else to communicate with them, but then you truly get into, you, you know, you know enough about the culture so that you could show appreciation and respect right yes Tr- truly being a global citizen and showing that you can get down with everyone nana does that he he has business relationships in the us in the uk and all throughout africa right so so that's the second and then the third you mentioned it it seems so simple but i'm telling you man i i, I find it fascinating in particular in black men who are able to excel is that even in the heights of the highest level of conflict that, that, that there's a smile. Yeah. And that I know is going to be debatable by a lot of people, but you know, I, I interviewed this guy, Carl Loco, who is, was the most notorious gang leader in the UK. This, this guy had a gang and they robbed drug dealers in South Brixton, right? O- Omar um, from the Wire in the UK. They, exactly. I love exactly, it. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. And so he, but he, but he smiled because Omar <laughs> smiled, <laughs> <laughs> right? But 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 so they used to call him the Laughing Giant because Carl Loco's really big, right? Yeah. And he would get into these street fights, right? People would pull out, you know, guns, whatever, on him, and he always smiled. He, people got freaked out with the smile, right? And and I've been consistently like really clocking these guys who in particular, the, the men, and I've noticed that the smile is disarming. Mm. And it's almost like, you know, it hypnot- it's like almost like a snake hypnotizing you, yeah. you know, because you don't know where they're coming. Like, wow, th- what? I'm telling you some really bad news and you're smiling like, or, you know, you're supposed to be upset, but you're smiling, you know, it's so long story short is that smile. I think also from Nana, that was incredible. I love it. I love it. And you know what? I really appreciate the the, the compliment on the podcast for myself and, and bringing the guests on. And it's funny because, you know, like I said, we've gone way back. And, you know, one of the things that I pride my podcast on, um, even with having guests on that, that you know, of the highest caliber like yourself is that I've never given a guest a list of questions that we're going to discuss in all of the years we've done this. I never give a list of questions because I'm confident in the people that I bring on. But more importantly, I believe that if this is really your 
realm of expertise. If you are really who you put out there on social media to be and that we have that connection, hopefully one, I'm able to discern it. But then two, you should have no problem with having a natural conversation. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, there's people that I've interviewed and I, you know, they ask for questions and sometimes I may give one or two, but those are the episodes that never make it to, to being published. Right. right. Is because you, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the word to give, but there's a, there's a confidence and there's a, a second gear. Um, I, I guess is the word I'll use a second gear in terms of being articulate and being able to talk to people like people skills are still a thing that nobody pays attention to. Right. Right. I agree. I agree. You know, if, if you are, and this is, you know, for every, for all of us, right. Yes. You have, we all should be good at something, you know, um, Cal Newport wrote one of my favorite books. So good. They can't ignore you. And his whole point in that book was try to identify one, two or three things that intersect that you could be so good, right. That the world can't ignore it. Yeah. You know, and one of the litmus tests for it, are you so good is can you t- talk without notes on that topic? Mm. You know what I mean? Um, but also, though, man, to your credit, Chuck, is that I think what, you know, it goes back to actually what I was saying earlier is you come on with the confidence, but also why I think you're so good. And I'm I'm by the way. I'm not here, for, and I'm talking to the audience. I'm not here to blow smoke up this man. Right? I'm, I'm just for That's real. So I'm funny. speaking fact, and you yes. all listen to him because you know this is fact. Is that you know? And I message uh, this to you, Chuck. Is that I think that you are an exceptional uh, interviewer. I think you're wow. world class, and part of what makes you world class is your ability to give comfort to the guest quickly. Right. So yeah. the guest not only feels so think about this is that within just a few moments, you made me feel both confident. So now I'm willing to take risk, maybe say things I wouldn't normally say. <laughs> and you made me feel comfortable. Yes. So you made me feel safe so that I can say these things. You know, yeah. that's skill. I really appreciate it. Let's let's talk about the, the Better With Paul podcast. Now, you know, now now we can focus on it. Right. Because you have obviously built out platforms. You've been on TV, you've been behind the camera, in front of the camera. What was it about the, the calling that you were getting from your followers that made you, or maybe just even the business opportunity that made you say, you know what, better with Paul works for me at this time in my career, because now I can do X, Y, Z. What was it that had you launch uh, that podcast? Cause I love it, but you know, I love, you know, these type of, these type of avenues. So. I've, I've always been scared to do a podcast and stop it. I have. And I know it sounds crazy. Cause Paul, you're like, what are we, you on TV for 10 years? I'm you really know? about to like fight you right now because never mind. Answer the question. Cause yeah. yeah no, and, well, well, let me tell you why. Here, here's the reason why I, I, I was quote unquote scared, right? Yeah. It's because I didn't feel at the time that I could share something new or different because mm. You know, I was like, there's so many people out here that already do great, say, interview shows. Not saying that you, ha- I have to do an interview format, but, sure. you know, they're already bringing on exceptional guests. They're already having great dialogue. What am I going to do differently? Like, what can I actually do differently? Right. And so three years ago, I started recording podcasts. Literally three years ago, I started recording podcasts. Wow. And I never hit publish until... We were going through, um, like, this was maybe four or five days into the lockdown. um, Oh, yeah, the quarantine. Quarantine, yeah. And a lot of people were reaching out to me to say, like, Paul, I'm freaked out. I'm going to lose my job. Or I don't know where I'm going to, you know, get income from. You know, what suggestions do you have? And so many people were messaging me that I decided to start coming on to LinkedIn and Facebook lives. Yes. Right. So I was going live. uh, First, it was once a week, then twice a week, then three times a week. (laughs) And what I noticed is that the, the audience was growing and it wasn't necessarily the size of the audience, but that the audience was growing, the engagement was growing, and it was one specific type of person that was really showing up. Let's go. 
So, so there's lots of people showing up, but there was one specific person. And I realized that is my quote unquote avatar, right? Mm. That's my audience. That's my avatar. And they're showing up because I am delivering something that they deeply need. And that to me was the green light to start podcasting when I realized I had an audience yeah. and I had a unique perspective for that particular audience. Yeah. Um, and, and that crystallized it for me. And, and, and that's when I, you know, that's when I hit publish. I think I can relate to the, the initial mm-hmm. part in terms mm-hmm. of when you said you, you were scared of, you know, putting it out there because as you were talking, I I started to think about it and I was like, you know what, for this podcast, for the Hawk Vision podcast to have 18 countries and, and 32 states or whatever it is by now, that part is intimidating just a bit because it's like, wow, people are really listening. And, and again, like you said, that audience is out there. And that's what I love about this space is that there's enough room for everybody. Like you used to tell me a long time ago that everybody has a story. You just have to earn the right to tell it. And I I think that's what this avenue brings is that we all have, uh, like Liam Neeson says, a special set of skills. (laughs) And, uh, I think that part is amazing. So I, if, if people ask me what podcast I listen to, um, yours is definitely at the top of the list because I like to sit at the feet of giants. I like to listen to people that um, can pour into me and have an elevated level of a thought process. Um, and and what better way to listen to, to, to Big Brother who's global? You know what I mean? Well, I appreciate it. I, I, I really do. I, I will say out of all of the different mediums, you know, that I've experimented in, whether it be TV or, you know, I still write my column for USA Today, yes. um, you know, blogging, going live on LinkedIn or whatever it may be, podcasting hands down is my favorite. Wow. I love it. I love it. We got uh, a, a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up because, again, you know, I'm respectful of your time. I don't even know what time zone you're in right now. But, you know, we <laughs> <laughs> look. I don't know which country you're in right now. It's like one of four. It could be Jamaica. It could be the UK. Like we, you know, I'm, 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 I'm going to respect the time. But you taught me back in the day. You said balance was not going to be a thing when you're trying to build your business. And you right. taught me that I could supplement that balance with better communication with the wife. Right. How do you and Jill manage to build and maintain momentum in your businesses with the boys growing up and running around as they are? You know, because when we got when we got started, the boys were infants, right? Like they may have been. I don't know who's the oldest, Liam. Uh, King 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 is the oldest. Yes, his birthday is. He's going to be ten. This okay, weekend. so yeah, so he was it was only Kingston. So how do you how have you guys managed to to continue with communication and a perception of balance while building your empire or adding to it, I should say? Yeah. Um I, I really appreciate this one because I think this is also where we have to be self aware enough, right? Um have enough understanding of our value, right, etc., to create systems for our own families. Mm. Um, And I think, you know, it's interesting. You could even look at this from an even higher degree and say, even as a black people living in the United States or living just anywhere in the world is that I think we really need to create our own systems because the systems that exist in the vast majority of the world truly were not either a built for us or conducive for us. Right. So, if you think about even us as as a family, so you know, my wife and I were entrepreneurs. Yes, and we have certain values, like we value legacy. You know, building something that out that outlives us, um, or we value culture. Really understanding culture, not like okay, let's read a book on this, but no, let's go live. No, you guys pack and- bags and leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and we and we um, and we and we value financial freedom. Yeah. You know, we, we, we value that. And so these are our core values. So we have methodically designed our life around that. So right now our boys are I mean, I guess almost all kids right now are at home. Homeschool. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But before the pandemic, our boys were homeschooled. Okay. And that gave us the flexibility to to travel all over the world. 
Um, and when I say travel all, all over the world, like literally, like we were, you know, um, my boys and, and we incorporate that. So we, and it, I guess long story short is that we incorporate our study. So whether that be our boys study or our business practice, we just incorporate that into our lives. So like with, uh, my boys, I'll never forget, we were walking somewhere and uh, someone was talking to my son, like we were, like a bellman was talking to my son and my son, my, my son Kingston said, oh, that's an interesting accent. Where are you from? Uh, the guy said, I'm from Romania. And uh, my, my Kingston said, I don't even know where Romania is. Wow. Um, who's from Romania? And the guy said, Dracula's from Ro- Romania. <laughs> and, and, and he said, you know, he's a castle there. And Kingston said, really? Right. So then Kingston wrote a report on Dracula, and then we flew and spent and flew to Romania. I love and, it. And, and stayed right there in Bucharest and went to Vlad Tepes's castle, you know, and one of these where we decided that's how we want to live. Yeah. And, and so we incorporate that. So we needed a business that could flex with that type of lifestyle. And, and how we maintain it is, I would say, ridiculous communication we always despite all the different projects we do we eat together we eat eat dinner every night we eat breakfast most of the times together but every night we eat dinner and even to the point where if i'm on a project and i'm running late the family will wait for me and we'll just eat at 9 p.m you know instead but we all eat together we spend sundays together we um we openly talk about everything. We talk about finance. Like my boys know like how much I make on my contracts, you know, it's I like, it. they, we, we're, we're, we're just incredibly, we, we try to like literally stay on the same page all the time. I love it. That's strong. I think. And again, you know, I'm all about, um, the reason why we even do this podcast, I think is because, People, I, I feel like people learn better when there's someone that they know, um, someone that they've watched go through the fire, so to speak, and someone can help them shorten the learning curve through their experiences. And, and that's why I do this podcast. And I and I loved when I remember we were at dinner and, and Tanil says, you know, he's always on the side of the bed working and we don't have time. And it was, you know, part of that growth stage for me where I was building and I wasn't able to articulate what it was that I was focused on correctly but since then you know i i never forget i know um and this is probably your fault actually at least (laughs) twice a week at least twice a week paul you'll be proud of me at least twice a week i cook dinner and at least once a month maybe twice we do something um either uh you know take the day to just shut down or do you know like go somewhere as a family or even just myself and her um and, and we do something together so that we can have that time to uh, communicate, pour in each other, talk about the vision, all that good stuff. So I, I always want to openly thank you for being big brother uh, and, and helping me out on some of these things as, you know, we grow this, this these businesses. Um, Love it. Love it. Yeah, man. You, you know, I, it's funny because I remember we were at the dinner. Remember we did the, when you did your book, matter of fact, when we did the, the, we went to dinner as the group. The whole group went to dinner and yes. you were saying something similar to about the communication or whatever the case is. And then while you were doing that, I was like, I'm going to go pay the bill. Like, I'm going to go make sure my man's taken care of. I get there. I get I finally get the waiter pulled to the side and he's like, yeah, Paul already paid it. <laughs> and so I got when you were sitting there talking about the communication, I come back to the table and I'm like, how did he do both of those that fast? Like, how does he so, you know, every time we talk is like I, I part of me is mad that I didn't get to pay for dinner. So the next time you're out here, <laughs> we're definitely doing dinner. And I refuse to let you even bring a phone, a wallet, anything that can pay. You can't bring. It. Yeah. But see, can I, I, I have to ask you this, man. Yeah. How where do you get th- this hospitality from? And I say that because yeah. and, and I'm I'm saying that earnestly because. I think you're incredibly, you know, hospitable. You know, like I, I talk about that trip, man. I that was when I did that book tour. I must have yeah. gone to 22 cities, and I remember one 
experience that was you picking me up in the truck yes. right like I, I remember that i remember you being just incredibly kind and gracious wow. and what i and, and what it reminded me of is and this is like no shade to you this is just a big sure, up sure. is it reminded me of like my grandparents era <laughs> you know like, yeah let me yeah come on in let me cook for you you yeah. know let me treat you well where does that come from two places if i wow that's a hard one two two places mainly one my my parents i think i'm you know my dad's retired military retired seal uh my mom's in healthcare and my dad always said to me that you will success leaves clues but they will never waste their time so if you have a chance you make everybody that's around you feel like they're at home because you never know when your name is going to be in rooms that you aren't in. Um, so that's one. And then two, as, as funny as this is, it's Tennille because mm, okay. she is, she is a much better human than I am. Like I, we joke about it all the time, but she is a much better human than I am in terms of thoughtfulness and planning. Like, you know, she's she's one of the people that will be like, all right, um, somebody's birthday is in six months. Have you thought about what you're getting? I'm like, I haven't even thought about lunch today. Like, really? <laughs> and so I think being being with her for so long, she has opened this door for me to ensure that everybody that comes into contact with me walks away feeling like they met a friend. And I think, you know, being from East Oakland is is a gift and a curse because we can be enemies easily. Right. But I think that that's the easy, immature route to take. And if I'm going to be true to the hustle, the work ethic, the belief, the vision that I always talk about, I have to be that right. It has to be a non-negotiable for me to engage in honest conversation. That's probably what makes everybody so comfortable coming on the show is that I, you know, if I can't have fun, I'm not going to do it. So for, in order for me to have fun, you got to be comfortable. Right. Right. And so I think that's it, man. It's just my my parents and the wife. I think those are the two most seminal examples that I have. And it's just rubbed off on me. Well, we 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 need more of them. (laughs) I'm I'm for real. I'm for real, because I think that's that's one piece, especially of black culture that I'm I'm seeing, um, you know, disappear around the world, man, around the world. So. So thank you. I mean, thank. So thanks to the thank yeah, your, thanks your to parents. the other pops. Right. I'll, I'll make Forget sure they you. get it. Yeah, exactly. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Um, real quick, what can you define the 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 non negotiables for Paul as you build your business, as you look at opportunities? What are the two or three things that every opportunity or venture has to have for Paul to sign off on it? Uh, same values. Yeah, same same values. A matter of fact, I mean, I'll be very very transparent in this one. Um, is literally, I am I'm negotiating two new TV deals right now. Okay. Um, and I was talking to my manager earlier, and he he well first I said and he was telling me he gave me an update, and I told him I responded back. I said, man, I'm a pass. Just you know. And he's like, are you sure? Like, this is, you know, what's, this is big, you know, are you sure you want to pass? And I said, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm going to pass. And I said, I'm going to pass because I don't feel like what I value is being acknowledged. Like, you don't even mm. have to respect it. Right. But you have to acknowledge what what I value, right? Which Actually, well, I won't even go into all that, but <laughs> it was, <laughs> I don't want to get myself in too much trouble. Right, but, right. We don't want to mess up no deals. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> things are good now. That's the thing. <laughs> things are good. By the afternoon, it, it got resolved. So, I love um, it. But I was, I was basically willing to walk on what I think 99% of the world would say, are you crazy? Like from the amount of money to the exposure, et cetera. Um, I literally, my text was, yeah, I'm going to walk only because I don't value it. And to show you how good my partner slash wife is, Mm -hmm. she was literally, she was sitting right here. So in our uh, uh, office here, I have a a couch 
So she normally works off the couch. I work at the desk. Okay. And she was right there. And I said, man, Jill, it looks like, you know, the, the deal is off. She, she, and she didn't blink. One. It wasn't like, what? Are yeah. you crazy? Are you not going to? She just like, all right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll let, let's get at this other thing. Then. Next she was just like, let's, let's go make it happen somewhere else, you know? I love and, it. Yeah. That's, and, and so, um, yeah, man. That's values. I need to see the the connection or acknowledgement of the values. Mm, I love it. I love it. And it, it, wow. See, that's the thing is a lot of people will say, you know, when they reach your level, um, it's easy to to look at the values over the money or the contract or the exposure or the opportunity. But I think those are the things that create the the money. Right. As those are the things that create the opportunities that they that they do is because you're held you hold yourself to a standard and now that standard is the only way people can approach yes you, you know what Chuck? can i say one quick story on yeah, this absolutely all right i, I think this will help, help to drive it home and this is i think the, the audience can really connect with this so when i came into the game uh i came my first show it was a blessing it was on the oprah winfrey network yes right? and what that did is it put me on the radar of a lot of production companies and networks. So I immediately uh, got a uh, invitation to come into BET. Okay. Right? And BET, they were talking about, oh, we're going to create this show around you. We're going to do blah, 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 blah. And then long story short, like, you know, a couple months into it, I find out that the deal is dead. And when I went to investigate why and started to really talk and find out, they basically said, man, Paul, we, we just didn't think you were black enough wow. for, you know, for the audience. Like, I was like, oh, what is black enough? Like, what is that is crazy. Like, you didn't give but, them a Jamaican accent. Maybe I don't I don't understand. Uh, but see, it, it, it gets even crazier. Right. So I wasn't black enough for them. Then another network. A matter of fact, I even named the network. out. It was it was NBC. And NBC was producing, it was the biggest, biggest relationship show ever. It was called Ready for Love. They put $50 million. Yes. In. You know, um, they had actually hired me for that show. So, so they ended up paying me, which I appreciate. But they fired me. And when, and I was like, what? Why am I getting let go? As a matter of fact, they let me go literally three days before I was uh, going to move to LA with my family. Wow. And the reason why, so we, we do our investigation, you know, trying to find out what happened. Reason why is we find out that, well, they did some tests and the test showed that I was too black. For, for you were their, too black for, their, for ready to love. I was too black for their audience, right? Which is now I think on what TV one with nephew Tommy and Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so here I was wow. not black enough and then too black now here's the point and this connects with what you said Chuck is that I could have and what most I, would, I shouldn't say most but what a lot of people do in those scenarios is they hear the feedback and they say okay well let me adapt to who you want me to be oh you want me to be whatever you consider to be more black let me find out what that is and let me do that right oh you don't want me to be as black let me oh you want me to sing and dance oh, okay i'll do that right right most of us adapt to what other people want us to be especially when it comes to tv because mm. they're talking checks they're talking right. big audiences now what's the key what's the only thing to prevent you from doing that Knowing your self worth. That's the only thing to prevent you from flipping in and morphing into somebody else. So I didn't do the BET thing and do the other thing. I just said, you know, I'm going to be me because this is who I am, right? Yeah. And I'm going to be me. And eventually that's going to allow me to do some incredible things. And it, it's taken 10 years on this road. But my God, man, I got. The, Two of the number one shows in in the UK. I have, you know, uh, a, well, a, another deal here in the US. Like on the TV side, yeah, I have outlasted all of my peers for the last ten years, and it's it like, and, and 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 I guess my point there is just that you have to really love yourself. It's not like 
you got to be egotistical, narcissistic about it. No, it's about loving all, uh, knowing that what makes you different is truly your superpower. Wow. And you have to really own that. What does the word vision mean for Paul Bronson? What does the word vision mean? He hit me with the deep for Paul Brunson. You Absolutely. Think about- yeah, I got to, I got to, you know, got to do the lower voice and the whole, you know, the, the slow motion, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt that the pacing got real slow. Yeah. yeah. I can't What's stand that you know this industry <laughs> so much. I love it. Okay. What what is what does vision mean for Paul Brunson? And I did it the same way. That's hilarious. Oh, man. It, it means, uh, it means being able to fulfill the values that I have, right? So, you know, I go back to legacy, culture, financial freedom, and there's there's other values, but those are some of the big ones. And so a vision to me, you know, this forward looking is being able to look into those values with a sense of accomplishment. Mm. So to know that I was able to create legacy, to know that I was able to really absorb culture and share culture, you know, to know I was financially free, you know, and I was able to exhibit that and teach that, right? That's vision to me. I love it. Um, If you had to leave, God forbid, you had to leave a two sentence statement for Kingston and Liam about their future in terms of belief, what would you say? you will truly you will truly achieve what you believe you know i i i think that there's this is funny you said just give me two sentences i'm about to give you a whole story but i, love I just it. leave it it's, no it's, that's, <laughs> that's why we're here you yeah. gotta elaborate you got we look we got enough time left for you to elaborate on this one yeah i i you, you know um so carol dewick wrote the book mindset okay and that book changed my life because I realized that I really grew grew up with a closed mindset. And for anyone who's listening right now who heard that statement, you thought one of two things. If, if you hear, you will achieve what you believe, right? Yes. If you hear that statement and you agree with that, then you have an open mindset without question. Yep. If you disagree with that, even if you, you like your disagreement, you're like, you know, Technically, you know, logically, like whatever it may be, <laughs> yes. if you disagree with that statement, it means you have a closed mindset. Now, there's a time and a place for open and closed mindsets, right? Yes. But the point is that having an open mindset really does open up opportunity for you. And I know this because I had a closed and I've evolved to an open or what could be considered a growth mindset. Sure. So I would really want to push upon the boys that they, they they will achieve what they believe but then the second piece because i think you gave me two right two sentences yes all right so the second sentence is always be kind that's it love it i love it last question what have you learned in business that you use in your marriage and vice versa what have you learned in your marriage that you use in business um that you focus on everything that starts with the letter p do tell. <laughs> I think I know where this is going, but do tell. <laughs> every, every, everything with the letter P is important in business and in your marriage, right? Um, so uh, let me give you an example, <laughs> right? I think I think everybody can run with this, but let me give you an example. In business, you focus on people. Yes. Processes. Yes. Product. Profit. Right? The P's. Yes. It's, it's everything. In your relationship, you focus on the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I love hey. it. That's You know what? That is the perfect way to end this episode. Paul, what, let everybody... <laughs> I can't believe you did that. Let everybody know where they can follow you uh, online. Oh, man. Follow me. And actually, I'll tell you what, this is what I'm going to say, man. Let me let me say this. Let me throw a wrench in this. I'm sorry. Absolutely. I'm going to throw a wrench in this. I'm going to say, don't even follow me. 
right? Don't <laughs> don't even follow me, right? Instead, if you were, if you thought anything that I said was of value, instead of quote unquote reciprocating through a follow, yes, reciprocate by acting on it. Mm. That's like that. That is it. I'm at a stage where I'm telling you, I'm blessed. My my part of this whole thing is legacy. Yes. That legacy is I want to see I love all people, but I, I, I specifically root for black people and I just want to see us come up. And I think a big part of how we come up is on a lot of the topics that we just talked about. Yeah. Self-love, emotional intelligence, right? Self-awareness, you know, all, 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 we, I think we hit we hit a lot of these things today on that. Act on that. You always raise the bar, and uh, I am always, as always, man, big brother, one of the world's most influential voices and, and somebody that I am happy to call more than a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to the one and only incomparable Mr. Paul Brunson. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe across all your major platforms. Share this with other visionaries just like yourself. This is the Hawk Vision Podcast. We will. Representing East Oakland, man.